Okay. All right, let's go. So we finished covering factoring, but we left a few examples to do last time. So let's just go over those quickly, and then we'll move on to the next section. Most of these have to do with the special formulas for factoring, like difference of squares, etc. So we had 9 minus x squared, 25 x squared minus 36, <coughs> x squared minus 16 over 25. remember um, the general approach to factoring. So we're not going to use all the techniques here, but you should know the techniques somewhat in order. If you want to factor something, give you a random problem, you should first check for if there's a general common factor, if there's a GCF to factor out. Then you look at the fact of if there are two terms, you look for is it difference of squares, difference of cubes, sum of cubes. And we won't go higher than that. Um, if there are three terms, you try that trinomial factoring, which we spoke about last time, which is the trial and error method, uh, or the AC method. And if there are four or more terms, you want to try a factor by grouping, and then you always try to see if after you apply some factoring rule, could you go further and apply another rule and factor, break it down even more. Okay, so that being said, let's just jump into this 9 minus x squared uh, factor. 3 plus x. 3 minus x. Right. Because right. just think of the 9 squared as 3 squared, it's a difference of squares directly. And what about this one? Yeah? 5x minus 6. What? 5x minus 6. So this is 5x minus 6. 5x plus 6. Times 5x plus 6. Again, difference of squares. The trick is to look at this as 5x all squared minus 36 is 6 all squared. So you get the difference of square there. C. What would that factor to? X minus, x minus 4 over 5. X plus 4 over 5. Again, you want to just think of this as x squared minus over 5x squared and apply the difference of squares. D. This one has two variables here, so getting slightly more challenging, but what's that? Plus, you mean 3y squared? Yeah, 3y squared. Yeah. And then 2x cubed minus 3x Right, and again, because you're thinking of this as 2x uh, cubed all squared, laws of exponents will tell us that simplifies to 4x to the 6. This guy is 3y squared all squared. Laws of exponents tells us that's 9y to the 4th. So that is again difference of squares. Back to this one. 
x minus 2 minus 4, x minus 2 plus 4. Simplify this even x minus 6 and x plus 2. You can just what that would factor as. What about f? Factor that. That's that's what this factors into. Um, but again, if you're applying factor by grouping, that's not how the method works. Factor by grouping means you take split into two groups and you factor out a GCF from each part. That's factor by grouping. Applying the difference of squares on half of it and factoring out a GCF on the other half is not factoring by grouping. Um, in either case, that's not going to work. That actually doesn't help us. then it would be x, x minus 5 times x minus 5 to okay. start. So you want to factor this part here? Would you say x minus 5 times x minus 5? Is there another way to write that? x minus 5 squared. So this is actually x minus 5 whole squared. Now, difference of squares. So it's x minus 5 minus y times x minus 5 plus 3. So here, yeah, you saw there were four terms, so you might have thought factor by grouping, but if you apply the factor by grouping form, you would realize it, it doesn't work here. So first of all, you should know what factor by grouping means. You split into two groups and you factor out the GCF. If you're applying a different method over here than over here, it's not factor by grouping. Right? And factor by grouping will only work if when you separate them in factor out GCFs, what's left over in the parentheses are the same thing. Here, if I factor out here, what's left over in the parentheses is going to contain an x, while if I factor something here, what's left over in the parentheses will contain y's. They won't look the same. Factor by grouping does not work on this one. Uh, the trick here was to realize that the first three terms is actually a perfect square, and then you end up with a difference of squares. So that was just a, like a, a fake factor by grouping. To see if you really get factor by grouping. What about G? Uh, x cubed plus 2x squared minus 9x minus 18. What would you do here? Yeah. This one's moving. <laughs> this one is <laughs> okay. So what? What's the common? So you split these into those two. So x squared. So x squared is a common term. X plus minus nine. Minus nine is the common term. Okay. So that has to happen for factor by grouping. Group it, and the GCF comes out of each pair. You don't have to do any special thing to one pair or another. And then you'd realize that what's left over in the parentheses is the same thing. Right? Whenever that happens, factor by grouping works. And so that's a common term you can factor out. Right? And then? Right, you can factor further. So we applied factor by grouping, we got some factors going, but x squared minus 9 is again something you could take further into different squares. So, valuable lesson with this one here. Sometimes a problem can fake you out and you think it's one method when really it's another method. But you should at least be able to be aware that 
even if your, your knee-jerk reaction is to do one thing, you should be aware that, hey, that's actually not going to work in this case, so I should try something else. Um, let's move on to H. After that, x plus two in the parentheses uh, x squared. Uh, it will be two two x plus uh, minus two x plus four. Right. The trick here is to realize that this is x cubed plus 2 cubed, so it's the sum of 2 cubes. And you apply the sum of 2 cubes formula, that's how that would factor. You wouldn't, you wouldn't factor again? Uh, could we factor again? Yeah. Uh, x squared minus 2x, what would that go into? Oh, no. That that can go further, which is which is usually. I mean, yes, you should be looking if you can factor further, but usually for a difference of cubes, it's not going to be the quadratic part is not going to be very nice. Um, usually, so yeah, it's good that you're looking for it, but I wouldn't worry about it if you don't see anything. Um, the quadratic part, it's a very rare when the quadratic part uh, of sum or difference of cubes. Factors further. Normally this part will give rise to either radicals or uh, complex numbers if you set it equal to zero. So usually you don't have to worry about that. That's just an oddity with uh, the sum and difference of cubes. The quadratic part usually isn't very nice. Uh, a cubed minus 1 over 27. What is that? A minus 1 third. So you're realizing that this is 1 third cubed, and now it's the difference of cubes. So a minus 1 third times? a squared plus a over 3. Find the difference of cubes formula. What about J? So you're thinking difference of squares? Yeah, and then I, and then I broke it down again after that. So you look at it that way, and I'll make a note with this one. Because this is one of the rare problems that just violated the thing that I wrote in red. Uh, so. Yeah, so you th think of it that way, you get difference of squares, that gives you x cubed minus y cubed times x cubed plus y cubed, then what? And then we'll break that down. Right, so this is difference of cubes here. And this is sum of cubes here. That's the full factor. Um, and this is another what this example illustrates, kind of what I've been talking about a, a lot. Um, you want to really think simple and apply the simplest rule you can first. So you might know that 
x to the 6 minus y to the 6, you realize you could think of this as x cubed squared minus y cubed squared, and you can think of it as a difference of squares. Um, but you might have also seen that this you can think of it as x squared cubed minus y squared cubed, and then think of it as a difference of cubes. Now, ultimately, you'll get to the same answer at the end. Okay. But it turns out that if you thought of it the second way, you'd have a harder time getting to the answer. So when you have a couple methods that would work, you usually apply the simpler one first. Okay. So a difference of squares is a lower level thing than a difference of cubes. Because if you, if you went with this guy, you'd have x squared minus y squared times x to the fourth plus x squared y squared plus y to the fourth. Right? Now this one is going to factor by difference of squares to give you that x minus y times x plus y. But seeing that this one factors is actually a lot harder. Because it doesn't right away lend itself to any of the methods that we saw before. So the AC method doesn't obviously work, and the trial and error method doesn't obviously work. Um, there is a trick that we could do here, but I haven't taught you guys yet. I'm not sure. Am I going to teach you guys that? No. There are a couple ways you could see it. Um, you would have to break the middle term into two parts and then do a factor by grouping. You can also do long division of polynomials to get to that answer. But the thing is, this is going to be really tough to deal with, at least with what we know so far. So I probably wouldn't go that method. It's much better to, again, think simple. Think of everything that looks complicated as there's a simple explanation. And if there are a couple explanations, go with the simplest one first. You always want to think of the simplest way to get out of a problem. Those are just some factoring examples to finish off that section. So we're going to move on to another section where we're going to remind ourselves how rational expressions work. section 1.4. There are two kinds of uh, rational expression that I want you guys to be aware of. Both of these are rational expression, but there's one that I want you to think of as its own category if possible. Um, so this is called the rational function. The rational function is one of form. y equals p of x divided by q of x, where your q of x is of course not equal to 0 because you can't divide by 0, and p and q are the polynomials. So these are just a special class of rational expressions, um, which we call rational functions. Rational doesn't mean, as opposed to irrational, or, you know, these are the really, you know, thoughtful functions. No, rational, the root word is ratio, means you're taking a ratio of two functions. Now, when, if you, usually when you see the expression rational function, it's referring to this guy. But when someone says rational expression, the, the word expression suggests something um, larger. rational expression
but P, Q don't have to be polynomials. Now, in the event that they're both polynomials, those show up pretty often, so it's nice to actually deal with them as their own thing. But there is a, a bigger picture here. There's a more general way to look at it. So guys over here, you would have examples like uh, x squared minus 1 over 2x plus 3 or 5 minus x minus x cubed over 3 plus x. Etc. The top is a polynomial, which we actually defined before. The bottom is a polynomial. So those are rational functions. Rational expression means we don't care about them being polynomials necessarily. So something like radical x minus 1 over 3x to the fourth plus 5. Something like that. It's not necessarily a rational function, it's a rational expression. So we usually indicate, we call it expression when we want to talk about a general algebraic expression. So that's implied here. So we defined algebraic functions before. But, um, that's what we mean. Now, what I want to talk about is the domain of each of these. rational expressions. One. So if we have p of x divided by q of x, and p and q are polynomials, so let's call this something, say f of x equals this, then the domain is it's going to be all real x such that q of x is not equal to zero. That is how you would find the domain of our irrational function, right? So if there are two polynomials and you're dividing polynomials, the only thing you need to worry about is where the denominator equals zero. Okay. Um, let's just do an example here. I could have y equals 3 plus x over x squared minus 1. And so what you would do is you would set x squared minus 1 equals 0. You'll realize that the solution is x equals plus or minus 1. And so for the domain, you only care about the denominator being 0. So how can you express that domain in general notation? This means for the domain, we do not want x equals 1 or x equals minus 1. So these are the two values where our denominator is equal to 0. It means we need to avoid those because the domain requires the denominator is not 0. How do you write that down? Negative infinity to negative one. Negative infinity to negative one. What? One to infinity? No. No. Negative one to Well, let's. So if you're not sure. Don't jump to conclusions. We can actually figure this out by sketching. Right? Number lines are super useful. So here's a minus 1, here's a 1. We know we do not want to be this. We do not want to be that. But quite literally, anything else would work, which means over here works. It can't be equal to that. But in between will also work. Uh, we can't be equal to 1, but out here would also work. So what interval is this? Negative one. Negative one. So, if you're not sure, now you just take the union, 
your domain, the x values you can plug in, they either live here or here or here. And the way you would say that is the domain of f is equal to minus infinity to minus 1, union minus 1 to 1, union 1 to infinity. So don't forget the middle part. That, that also works here. So now, if you have two polynomials, that's all you need to worry about. For general expressions, though, this is not the case. So that's the second situation for the domain here. So let's call this 1g. So let's say this is p of x over q of x, and this is just a general rational expression. So it doesn't have to be polynomials. It can throw whatever kinds of functions in there. And so the domain of G equals, it's a little bit more complicated. We've done actually an example like this before, but let me just remind you how we did it. It's, it's an intersection. of the domains for P, Q, and the X's where Q is not zero. All right, so you have to check a few things here. So you need to make sure that individually the functions work, as well as the Q function is not zero. Uh, we saw an example like that already. Uh, I believe it was even on a quiz at this point, where we looked at something like, I believe it was 1 minus x over the radical of 9 minus x squared or something similar to that. So here it is a rational expression. We have a division of two functions, but the functions aren't polynomials. So now, not only is it important to know that the denominator is not zero, it's also important for the radicals to work. And we know for the radicals to work, we need what's underneath them to be zero or positive. So here, what we did was, uh, just to remind you, so here, we need to find, first of all, the domain of the top domain at the bottom individually and we need to make sure that the bottom is not zero itself. Right? So there are a couple things we need to check here. So if you have just two polynomials being divided, you only need to worry about the denominator being zero and you're good because otherwise the polynomials will work anywhere. However, if you kind of throw other functions into the mix, now depending on what those guys look like, it might change the answer a little bit. For example, the radicals have restrictions themselves, so you need to figure that out. So we know for this one, for this to work, um, we need 1 minus x to be greater than or equal to 0, which means your x should be less than or equal to 1. For this, we know that we need 9 minus x squared to be greater than or equal to 0. Which means, again, 9 minus x squared is an upside down parabola. It will be negative on the ends, and in the middle it will work. So our x can be between 3 and minus 3, and that will be fine. And here, to make sure this is not 0, we need our x to not be plus or minus 3 themselves. So then we kind of work with where do all of these work at the same time? And again, it's nice when you're looking at a domain to just draw a number line and put all these guys together on one page. You can draw the number line. Start with one at a time. Okay, so one, you can put it here. This guy works for one and less. Then we can have here, we have another guy that works between minus three and three. So it's here to here. 
and this guy works everywhere except minus 3 and 3. So he would work here, he'd work here, and he works over there. So now you pretty much pick the region, you pick the intersection. Where are all of them working at the same time? And you realize that will be between here. This is where all three lines are present. You need all three to be firing. Notice here that this is omitted, but the one is included in all of them. So for a function like this, I can say the domain of y would be not including the three, but it can include the one, so that would be the domain. So if you're just dividing polynomials, all you need to worry about is where the denominator equals zero. If you're dividing other things, there's much more to worry about. You have to worry about where the individual functions work and where the denominator is not equal to zero. You have to satisfy all requirements at the same time. So that's why I like to separate them into two kind of thoughts. You know that if you only have polynomials to work with, it's a lot easier. And there are a lot of things that would apply here. Um, but in the general case, it's a little bit more complicated. So that is talking about the domains and what these functions are. Now we're going to remind ourselves how to actually deal with them in a math problem. How would we simplify these? also apply to these functions. Um, so the properties of fractions in section 1.1 apply here. So that's that's actually kind of the important thing you want to take. Alright, so for example, if A and B are A, B, C, B, are algebraic expressions, right? So these guys are some functions that could have radicals in them and all sorts of things going on. But if these are algebraic expressions, then for example, you can take A over B and you divide it by C over D, you would still think of this as keep change flip. Uh, right? you still, that still applies. So all the rules that you know about fractions, finding common denominators, all that stuff would apply to these functions. So knowing those rules very well, is, they will help you here. So, et cetera. So that's important to remember. And that being said, I probably don't have to say much more other than to just jump into some examples. Because all the rules we kind of know already. So let's just go through some examples where we're just applying these rules. Talk about one category separately. So let's just jump straight into some examples. There's one category I want us to have in our minds. The 
it'll save you a lot of trouble here, but it'll also, especially for those of you going on to calculus, will save you a lot of trouble in calculus. Because just not realizing that you can do this is, is going to usually make your life harder than it has to be. So the first topic I want to cover here is dividing by monomials. Whenever possible, you do actually want to divide these. It'll usually make your life easier. Remember, a monomial is just uh, an expression with one term. So example, it's basically if you have a bunch of things, 10x to the 5 plus 8x to the 4 plus 6x cubed all over, just like one thing, like 2x squared. Or squared y plus 4x squared, <coughs> squared minus 6x squared y squared all over minus 4xy. So sometimes you can have rational expressions where in the denominator you literally just have one thing. And normally how we would deal with these if you want to simplify or think of that in simpler terms, if there's literally one thing in the denominator, you apply that rule, and again, we're applying a rule here. The rule you should think about is like if you have a sum of things over a single thing, we know we can actually break this up into that. Right? So if you see something like this, in the vast majority of cases, that's kind of how you're going to want to apply it. You're going to want to take that denominator and apply it to each term in the numerator. So you want to think of this as 10x to the fifth over 2x squared plus 8x to the fourth over 2x squared plus 6x cubed over 2x squared. And now you can simplify based on the laws of exponents. So this will give us what? Huh? 5x cubed. 5x cubed. Because the 2 reduces into the 10 and we just subtract the powers. Here. So there are times in this class, but especially in calculus, where if you dealt with this as a division, it'll take you forever to deal with it. If you're doing something like the quotient rule, don't worry if you don't know what that is. Um, but if you simplify it first and do it here, it allows you to use another rule called the power rule, which is much simpler. So just being aware that this is a thing you can do at any point and it's not illegal is a good thing. Right? Because dealing with this, there are contexts in which dealing with this is a really a lot of work. Whereas if you just write it like this, it's not much work at all. It's a one liner. Similarly here, you do the same thing. So it's 2x squared y over minus 4xy plus 4xy squared over minus 4xy minus 6x squared y squared over minus 4xy. The first one simplifies to 1. What's the first term? X over two, X over negative two. Right. Minus X over two. Uh, this cancel into that. Two times this X kills one of those X's. The Y's cancel completely. So you have an X left over in the top and a minus two in the bottom, which is negative X over two. This one. Fours cancel. You know, there's a negative sign that we can pull out. The X's cancel completely. And this y kills one of those y's, so you just have minus y. Here, negative divided by negative becomes positive. This x kills one of those, this y kills one of those. And 2 goes into this 2 times, goes into that 3 times. So we pretty much have 3xy over 2. And so that would be the answer here. So the idea with these are simple. Divide the monomial into each term.
binomial into so you have a huge division, but there's one thing in the denominator, just divide it into everyone. If at all possible, it will 99.9% of the time make your life a lot easier thinking of this as that. It's, it's worth noting though, I should mention something here. Might come up. It'll, it'll definitely come up in calculus. I'm not sure if it'll come up here. But what you should know is that simplifying So this might be something that you can get in trouble with. It does not fix the domain. That's something you should be aware of. So you might start with that. You can simplify to this. And you might think, oh, this is a polynomial. So it should just behave. It doesn't exactly behave like a polynomial. You're still not allowed to plug in x equals 0 here. Because x equals 0 does not work from the beginning. Right? Here, the denominator is 0. If, if x equals 0, denominator is 0. 0 is still going to be a problem here. Right? So simplifying can help you solve problems easier, but you have to remember the original function, whatever restrictions it has, its simplified version will have those same restrictions. So a lot of times students get into trouble because they simplify something, they work with a nicer function, but they forget that, oh no, the original function had issues with it. So you eliminating the issues doesn't really eliminate the issue. Eliminating it on paper is not eliminating it in reality. This is just a simpler way to think about the problem. So that's, that's important. It is important here in the, in the case of when we'll get to solving inequalities, and you'll see where something like that will really uh, come back to bite you. Right? Where the idea where you can simplify an inequality, but if you cancel anything and you forget to account for it, uh, you'll, you'll mess things up. So that, that should be in the back of your mind. So this is a very easy case, but understand that there are caveats to doing this. So that's the first thing. Now let's move on to some more robust examples to make sure we all know our rules and we can apply them effectively. These are some more general examples. Uh, and what I want you to do here is we're going to simplify them or combine as appropriate. I give you simplified, if there are several things, I want you to combine them into one thing. Eight. Let's start off, not so bad here, 4x, 4, 5y cubed times 25y to the fifth, 12x to the seventh.
times, because some of these are just getting ridiculous. Let's see. This was an algebra class I drew with those guys, but here I just want to essentially draw the here. Here, let's jump down to this example. some of these. So this is testing you on multiplications and divisions, as well as addition and subtraction. Places? What do you mean? Oh, you mean put the y's on top of the y's and the x on top of the x? Sure, we can do that. And I would definitely recommend that, especially if there were a separate thing, uh, more fractions to worry about here. But I think with only two fractions, we're kind of okay with working with this. Part right, what I, I would say not to do for sure is to actually first apply the multiplication rule and just multiply across, right? Because that's a rule, right? So. So we have a rule, right, we simplify. So we do have a rule that says this is equal to AC over BD. And sometimes I see students, they see something like this, and what they do is they immediately start multiplying across to get into one big fraction, and then they start reducing from there. That's always harder than reducing before multiplying. So what I want to do here is start reducing before, start reducing or multiply. Right? So this is a rule. It's correct to do this, but it's harder to do by hand if you do that first. Right? So start reducing before the actual multiplication takes place. Multiply. So in that case, what can we start doing here? Five would go into the 25, five times. 4 goes into 12, 3 times. 4 goes into 12, 3 times. Y cubed goes into Y to the third. So that's 5 minus the 3. That gives us a 2 up there. So 4 goes into that. That goes into that 4 times, so you're left over with 3 factors. And so what we have here, what do we have left over on the top? One. Everything cancels, so you're left over with one. Don't think there's just a void there or there's a zero there. It means there's a one there. What do we have over here? Where everything literally cancels, so we just have one over here. Five y squared. Five y squared. Three x cubed. And so basically that would be the answer because you're just multiplying that by one. As opposed to 
you multiply the 4 by the 25 to get 100, the 5 by the 12 to get 60, then you have to worry about what goes into 160 at the same time. Reducing that would be harder. So, so the trick with these, if there's a trick, start simplifying things before you actually start multiplying across. That's the, that's the important takeaway for things like that. that factoring by the trial and error method versus the AC method actually makes our lives easier here. We learned to do that one. Um, so, okay, what would we do here? Keep change flip, the rule, that rule still applies, so this first thing you'd probably do is think of this as a multiplication of this guy. Which pretty much on a test, if this was a given question, I would start your first line here. Don't recopy the question, you're just wasting some time. Just start writing out this one where you flip the second one. Okay, that being said, how do we start? Right, we want to start reducing, so we need to factor. That's the point of factoring, right? So what would we do here? Top factors. X plus three. Plus three, x plus four. Two x, x plus two. X plus one, x plus two. Uh, now there's a one here. Oh, is there? Yeah, there's a 1 there, so you can't have a 2 and a 1. Uh, what happens there? We can't really do anything with that. We're on the bottom one here. Okay, got 3x. I made that a two, it would work out nicely. Make it two. <laughs> <laughs> we could just make it two. I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with that. That could just be whatever you're given. But if you made this a two, get to cancel off. Right? There, there's something satisfying about canceling. Things. But you gotta kill him, kill him, kill everybody. So at that point, now that would factor into x plus one x plus 2, right? So that allows us to cancel a few more things. And so that just leaves us with x plus 1 squared on the top and 6x squared on the bottom. Let's look at this one. So that is me, I'm just going to copy down the multiplication. Factor A cubed minus B cubed. 
So we see a difference of scores here. A minus B, A squared plus AB plus B squared over So this one, um, again, we have so much going on. I probably wouldn't want to go separately and do the AC method, so we're probably going to try to do some uh, factoring uh, by trial and error here. It's worth mentioning that normally if a problem like this shows up on a test, you can just use and really more than this is more of a social engineering tip than a math tip, right? Because normally if uh, someone writes this on a test, they want stuff to be reduced. They're going to want you to show that you can factor stuff and cancel stuff. So you can kind of assume things are going to cancel out in a nice way. So even, let's say you're a little bit shaky on factoring by the trial and error. What you can do is you can just go through and factor whatever is easy to factor. So here, if we factor this, what would that happen? We can just factor out a 4, right? So we have 2a plus b, right? Now you know from the whole trial and error method that this would be a 2a and an a. And so you're like, they probably want us to cancel a 2a plus b here. So you would, as a trial and error, you kind of pretend that this is a plus b, and then you kind of work backwards. Well, if that's a plus b, how would I get 2b squared? Well this had to be a 2b here. And then you can check after the fact, did, does that actually work? Here's an ab, here's a 4ab, and that does give me 5ab. So ah, it turns out that that gamble works. Right? Now that gamble works just because it's a test problem. Right? <laughs> because you know, OK, Javon's trying to check if I can factor stuff and cancel. So whenever you have a bunch of things that you have to simplify, you can kind of say, OK, let me factor all the easy ones first. And then by seeing what's left over there, the more complicated ones will probably break into pieces to complement that stuff. Right? So you can have that working out. In the same way, when you're down here, first of all, you can realize that there's a common A that factors out. Now this is another thing. This is two B squared. Two A B. In fact, two A comes out. Times two A. So from here, uh, two A is a GCF. I just factored out two A. What? You just factor it out. Factor what out? You factored out the two A, but what's remaining you can factor. You can um, cancel out the new. Right. So now I realize that this here is your two A. This you'd realize that this can't factor. There's no two because the coefficient here is one. So you just try that rule where oh, find two numbers that multiply to give you one, but they add to give you one. You realize there aren't such numbers, so you kind of leave this alone. But now you kind of realize, oh, that actually matches up with this. So that's OK. So now I can start. I can cancel this with that. I can cancel this with that. The 2 kills the 4. So ultimately, what I have here is what? <laughs> yeah, 2a minus b is what's left over in the top. Right, there's a 2 here and an A minus B there. And what's left over in the bottom? A, a times A plus 2B. A times A plus 2B. So that's what that would simplify as. Right. So just realizing that, OK, this is supposed to simplify. It can make the trial and error method a lot easier to digest it. Where are we? So let's 
2 over x squared plus 4x plus 3 minus, and now we're learning how to subtract it, x squared plus 5x plus 6. Okay, so how do we add two things? Huh? You have to get the same denominator, right? Why? Because with fractions to combine them, you get the same denominator. How do you figure out how to get the same denominator here? You would, again, factor that, because you might have remembered, back when we wanted to combine the adding two fractions and finding their LCD, what we did was we factored the numbers, right? So if one denominator was 12 and the other one was 24, we factor the 12 into, into 4 times 2 times 2 times 3 and factor the 24 into its factors and then we kind of see who is missing from who. So we're going to, going to use that same trick here. So I would actually factor this. Uh, what does that factor? Into? X plus 1, X plus 3. I would factor this. That factors into what? X plus 2, X plus 3. So I see right away that this has an x plus 1 and that doesn't, so I can multiply and divide. This by x plus 1. And this has an x plus 2 that this one doesn't have, so I would multiply and divide by an x plus 2. So in factoring the denominators, I can see what factors are missing from each. So now I get to create a common denominator. So this is going to be equal to, this will be all over x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x plus 3. In the top, right, you'd have to foil, you'd have to multiply out. So that's going to give us 2x squared. It's going to give us uh, 2x, 4x uh, minus 2x plus 2x, then minus 4, minus parentheses, very important here. What's x plus 1 times x minus 1? x squared minus 1, that's the difference of squares. So this now gives us 2x squared minus x squared, and this with x squared, plus 2x, and then we have minus 4 plus 1, is minus 3, over, I don't know what that was, okay, so here I'm continuing, over the x plus 1, x plus 2, Three. Now, I probably mentioned, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this before, but when you're simplifying fractions, you never expand the denominator. I'm always going to keep it factored like that. Because now I want to see, will anything cancel? Can the top factor now? X minus huh? 3 and X plus 1? X plus 3 and X minus 1. Those. 
plus one over two is plus one. Right, same, same deal, right? You think of this five as five over one, so you want to create the common denominator, so obviously that's missing the factor of two x plus one over two x plus one. So now you can combine everything over two x plus one. So it's five times two x plus one, 10 x plus five minus x. So you get nine x plus five. Simplify that one. Yeah. Yeah. You realize here this denominator is just the negative of that one. So what you could do is just just notice that this is minus the other one. So then you can just come think of this as instead of a subtraction, think of it as an addition. Now if the denominators are the same, we can just add the fractions. Same denominator. And does that simplify? I mean, this goes to 2x squared plus x plus 2. So that doesn't simplify, but so that would be the answer. gone over this even since this semester, so I, I, this is really just a matter of being thorough here. I want to remind you about rationalizing. So let's look at some examples here. Simplify um, by rationalizing. over 1 minus radical 3 b. 9 plus x minus 3 over x. This one should be interesting. x to the 1 third. Simplify by rationalizing. What would we do here? Yeah? You multiply the conjugate. Multiply and divide by the conjugate. So what's the conjugate? So multiply by radical. So obviously it's here. So you have 1 plus radical 3 over 1 plus radical 3. And remember the point of that is 
it makes the denominator look like the difference of squares. Now it looks like an a minus b times an a plus b. Where that's your a, that's your b, this is a, this is b. So that's why we multiply by that, that's why that's the conjugate. So now, that means the denominator will become a squared, right, it's just one squared, minus this squared, which is just three. So now there are no radicals there. In the top, we have 2x times 1 plus radical. So this implies a 2x times 1 plus radical 3 over minus 2, and the 2s will cancel. So we're left with just minus x times 1 plus radical. By, by the conjugate, uh, what is that going to be? 9, nine plus x plus 3. Plus x plus 3. Over. So again, now in the numerator, again we have the difference of squares formula, the factor inside of it, a minus b times a plus b. So that would simplify into a squared minus b squared. Denominator, we would have x times radical of 9 plus x is 3. In the top, 9 and minus 9 will kill each other. We'll have x over x times this. Now the x's would cancel. might seem like a blasphemy to somebody, oh, no, this right and deny it. We don't care. There are many scenarios in which that form will be easier for us to deal with than that form. So you need to know how to both rationalize a numerator and a denominator because in, there are cases where one might be a more beneficial form as opposed to the other. Finally, let's talk about C. Cube root of x minus 2 over x minus 8. Let's simplify that. What's the numerator going to become? Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> cube root, wait, no, sorry, x, x minus 4, the numerator? No. I mean, what does this look like to you? Like, it looks like a difference of squares, right? A minus B, A plus B. What does that give you? Right, so A squared would look like what? It wouldn't be X. X squared? What would it be?
Yeah. Is it x squared minus four? X squared what? Minus four. Oh, x cubed. What is the cube root of x? Oh, six. Huh? It's six. As a power, what is the cube root of x? X to the 1 over 3. X to the 1 over 3. So if I want to square that, that's the same as squaring this, right? What's that? So it will be uh, x well, squared, right? no, cube root x squared? It will be x to the 2 thirds, right? We raise the power, so we're on the power by multiplying the powers. Don't forget the rules. Okay. So minus 4. That's what that would look like. But now if you look at that, it's not at all very different from the original, is it? Because all you've done now is you still have the cube root, but now you've added a square to the x. It doesn't look much better. It's not going to really simplify. It turns out that that guy is not the conjugate for this thing. Now, remember the, uh, the process here. Why is it that when I have a radical, just a square root, the conjugate just comes down to repeating the thing but changing the sign? It's because I know to get rid of the square root, I need to square, right? So applying a difference of squares formula allows me to square that, right? Now, if I have a cube root, what do I want to do to get rid of the cube root? I need to cube it. However, how do I ensure that I cube this and I cube that? What would that look like? I want to cube this so that I get rid of all the radicals. So, what? Multiply by x minus 8. Well, if I multiply and divide by x minus 8, x times that would be x to the 4 over 3. It's not going to be the same. So the idea is I have something like this, and I want to multiply by something. Right? And my goal at the end of the day is to get this to be cubed. And maybe do something separately to this. Eh, I wouldn't mind if it's cubed as well. Especially since 2 cubed equals 8. That might be nice. Yeah? So wouldn't you be cubing the whole thing? Like no, I'd be cubing individual things. So I guess I'm saying like you would cube, uh, you know, the cubed root of x and negative 2? Sure. I want to cube the cube root of x, which will only give me x, getting right. rid of the radical, and then cube the 2, which gives me 8, which is also a nice number. How do I achieve that if I have this? What is the thing I need to multiply by? Oh, the square. square. No? What square? What do you mean? The square. Do you see it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Go. Would it, would it be um x to the six? Something with x to the six. So would it be? No. Focus on this. Focus on the AB. I have AB. I want to cube the A and cube the B, so I can get rid of a cube. Yeah. It would be a, a squared plus AB plus B squared. Right. So that's what I need to multiply by. So in other words, if something is a cube root, your conjugate actually has three terms in it. Why? Because you want to do the difference of cubes formula. Right? So in other words, if this is my A, in order to get the conjugate of that, I need to multiply by the square of this plus this times that, plus this squared. That's going to be the conjugate.
So now, why is that? Is because now you'll notice what I have here is a minus b. This would be a squared plus this would be a times b. And this would be the b squared. 2 squared is 4. So it means if I multiply by that monstrosity, which looks really ugly to begin with, it actually simplifies very nicely. It'll just cube this, which will give me an x, minus it'll cube that, which will give me an 8. So the entire numerator simplifies to that. Now, in the denominator, <coughs> we will just multiply those together. What you would notice now, this actually cancels with that. And you end up with 1 over x to the 2 thirds plus 2 x to the 1 third plus 4. That would be what that signifies. How, how did you get to just x minus 8 on the, on the, in the numerator? Oh, because what multiplying by this, this looks like that's the cube root of x is my a, and 2 is my b. So if I take a minus b and I multiply by something that looks oh, like this, okay. what it's going to do is it's going to cube this and cube that. Because this product gives me a cubed minus b cubed. So a conjugate doesn't just mean change the middle sign. It depends on what power you want to apply. So when there's a square root here, I only need a difference of squares formula. So I just change the middle sign and we're good. If there's a cube root here, I need a cubing formula. So I use the sum or difference of cubes as appropriate. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, for one, cubing the entire fraction is actually illegal. Like, you do that, it's wrong, right? Like, if I give you the number 2 and I say simplify this, and you decide, oh, let's just cube the 2, you get a different number. You're changing the value. So to simplify something, you can't just cube. On top of that, you have to remember that powers do not distribute across sums. So if you went along and cubed this, even if there was a way to do it legally, this will actually multiply out and give you four things. It will actually be a lot more complicated. Because now the formula a minus b all cubed, well, that's just a cubed plus 3a squared b. Well, this is minus plus 3ab squared minus b cubed. Right? That doesn't simplify anything. Right? Because this, if you just cube the entire thing, you have to re remember that that's a minus b times a minus b times a minus b. All right, so that's not cubing the individual, right? That's just being part of the cross sums. So for one, cubing like that, illegal. You can't cube because there's no equation, right? Even if you could, wouldn't help you, right? You'll actually end up in a much worse situation. Right? Because cubing the individuals is very different from cubing the sum because powers do not distribute across sums. There's another way you could see this by directly applying the difference of cubed formulas in the denominator, which is another way you can look at this. So let's say I have the cube root of x minus 2 over x minus 8. One thing you could notice is that the denominator I can think of as the cube root of x cubed minus 2 cubed. And that directly looks like a cubed minus b cubed. At this point, I can apply the difference of two cubes formula in the denominator. So I know that would just become a minus b times a squared plus a b plus the b squared. And then I would just cancel like this, and I get back here. 
So there are a couple ways you can actually see it. You could multiply by and divide by the conjugate, but you have to remember the conjugate depends on whether you want to cube things or square things. Right? Or you can just rewrite the denominator. Think of the denominator as a cube. And it's that one. conjugation stuff. So I was thinking we could at least start 1.5, but I guess we won't get there. We'll just finish up by talking about complex and compound fractions. So that's the third thing here, complex. But some people don't like this word because complex numbers, people sometimes think about complex numbers and that's it. Another word for this is compound. And these are just uh, when you these are just when you have fractions inside of fractions. So it's like when you have a fraction, but in the numerator and denominator there are more fractions. So for example. And again, we've looked at these before. I feel like that particular example we've done a lot. Another example would be something like 1 plus 1 over x plus 3 divided by 1 minus 1 over x minus 3. I believe a problem like that was on the quiz reason. Another example would be something like 1 minus x, 1 minus 1 over x cubed, all over 1 over x, plus 1 over x squared, plus 1 over x cubed. example and we'll be done with this 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1 over x. So with that we'll complete section 1.4. I'll make the homework for this due on Monday. I think we just have one section left to do. But let's just knock these out quickly. Again the my preferred method here is to multiply and divide by the LCD. So I'm going to do the problems that way. If you prefer to combine the fractions individually first, if you go home and do that on your own time, compare, see who you like more. So seeing something like that, I will notice that the LCD is actually x times y. So what I would do is multiply by x, y over x, y. So I'll take this guy and multiply each term by a distributive law, then take the bottom and multiply each term by the distributive law. And so this will simplify right away. 1 over x times x, y, the x's will cancel. I will be left with a y. 1 over y times x, y, the y's will cancel. I'd be left with an x. 1 over x times x, y, the x's will cancel. I'd be left with a y. 1 over y times x, y, the y's will cancel. I'd be left with an x. And you can't really do anything there. So that's. So it's still a fraction, but it's not a complex fraction anymore. It's just a regular fraction. Right, so before I had fractions inside of a fraction, now I just have a very a much simpler fraction. And sometimes that can make all the difference in the world. So 1 plus 1 over x 
plus 3 over 1 minus 1 over x minus 3. So I notice here that LCD is, well, x plus 3, x minus 3. So what I would do is I would multiply by multiply by x plus 3, x minus 3, over x plus 3, x minus 3. Now I know that simplifies it to x squared minus 9, but I'm not going to write it like that because I want to see who's canceling. So distribute, multiply here, multiply there, multiply here, multiply there. So in the first case, I have the x plus 3, x minus 3 times the 1. In this case, the x plus 3s would cancel, and I'd be left with x minus 3. Over here, I'd have x plus 3, x minus 3. Over here, the x minus 3s would cancel, and I would be left with minus x plus 3. So that's already a simpler fraction. Um, but we still have some factors going on here. Let's see if we can simplify that. These two individually, uh, remember that these guys will actually give us x squared minus 9. So in the top, I end up with x squared plus x minus 9 minus 3 gives me a minus 12. Denominator here, I have x squared minus 9. So that's an x squared minus x. And I have a minus 9 minus 3. So again, I have a minus... Uh, yes, I have a minus 9 minus 3, so I get that. Do you use factor? Yeah. No. You should, right? Yeah. I feel like 4 and 3 should work. Yeah. So 4 and 3. So if I make it a plus 4 minus 3, that'll work. Um, in the denominator. X minus 4, X plus 3. X minus 4, X plus 3. So it seemed like there was a lot of potential, didn't pan out. <laughs> one more minute. Let's do this one and you can try that one. What's the LCD here? X to the third. X to the third. Just multiply and divide by X cubed. Multiply at the top, this will give us x cubed minus 1. In the denominator, this will give us x squared plus x plus 1. Uh, the top is the difference of cubes, because 1 is 1 cubed. So this would factor it to x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. The denominator would factor it to x squared plus x plus 1. It doesn't factor, but that we're able to cancel it. That is just x minus 1. Okay. We'll stop there. Uh, we'll start with equations next time, section 1.5. If you're reading ahead, notice that we are skipping 1.6 and 1.7. So after 1.5, we're actually moving on to 1.8.